Good morning. You know, I don't do this uh, as often as I should, but I just want to say a big thank you to uh, Kim and Arlene. Yeah. Who uh, just, you know, every Sunday they're here, they're playing, they get us in the mood for worship, you know, just some beautiful music. And so, ladies, thank you very much for uh, what you uh, do here for the church. Um, For the rest of you, welcome. Glad you're here, and thank you for being here, too. You can give yourself a round of applause if you want to. Um, You know, get up, get out of bed, take a shower, some of you. Um, (laughs) And, uh, no, it's just just a good day to be in God's house with God's people to uh, just worship Him in in spirit and truth. And so we're going to open it up with a word of prayer, and then we're going to sing our uh, first hymn, hymn number 10. How great thou art. And we need to sing that one from the top of our lungs because he is definitely great. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for who you are. Lord, and that you are great. Lord, and that you are mighty. Lord, that you are sovereign and that you are worthy. Lord, we exclaim that here this morning. Lord, just... uh, Help us to to worship you this morning for who you are. Lord, help us see you in a new light today. See your greatness. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, Thy power throughout the universe displayed Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee How great Thou art, how great Thou art Then sings my soul, my Savior God to Thee How great Thou art how great thou art when through the woods and forest glades i wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees when i look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art And when I think that God, his son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come, with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee How great thou art, how great thou art. 
Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we have a lot this morning to uh, come to you about. Lord, from, from injuries to, to sickness and illness. Lord, through uh, death and mourning. Lord, that uh, just shows us that, that life's hard. Lord, we know that there's tragedy and that there's... Um, Lord, but we also know that you are triumphant. Lord, and that uh, you can, can comfort and you can lift up. And Lord, you can uh, mend. You can heal. Lord, and so we ask that you do all of those things in each one of these situations, Lord. Whatever it is that they need, Lord, we know that you can provide. And so, Lord, we ask that you do that. Lord, just provide in the only way that you can. Lord, and let's give us, let, let us give you the honor and the glory for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you all of my days. I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath all that I am never cease to worship. Colossians 3 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. i 
darkness you can call You restore every heart that is broken Great are you, Lord It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise to you only Every heart that is broken Great are you, Lord It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise to you only Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you, Lord. And all the earth will shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Great are you. Shout your praise, our hearts will cry, these bones will sing. Pray, are you Lord? It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you only. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our praise It's your breath in our lungs So we pour out our praise to you holy Please be seated Okay, so this morning is the moment that you've all been waiting for all summer. The end of Ecclesiastes. We are at the very end of this book. We have went through all 12 chapters, or we will when we finish this up here this morning. Um, I think we have been confused. We probably have been confounded. We have been convicted all in the matter of the last 14 weeks. Solomon has written this book and every part of the book of Ecclesiastes brings it to this point this morning. This is the purpose for which Solomon did all of his investigation he looked at everything under the sun. He tried everything under the sun, and it brought him to this final conclusion today. He's going to tell us how we should have, how we should live our life in the light of everything that we have studied for the last 14 weeks. This is the so what. Of the passage. This is what it really means when he looked at life under the earth or under the sun, excuse me. He is looking at life 
under the earth now, um, three or 4,000 years later. Um, but I think as the, the TV, the screen there says, this is the wisest instruction that he's probably ever given anybody in his life. This is something that we need to take a hold of. And I heard, uh, was reading a, another pastor this week, and he talked about this is the directions. These are the directions that Solomon is giving us. He's giving us the directions that we need to follow if we want to live a life that is pleasing to God. Now, here's the problem with that. I don't follow directions very well. I don't. You know, you. Uh, I remember Carl and I had... I think we'd been married maybe about six months, and we were living in this little farmhouse in, in the west part of Charlotte, and, and we, we needed an entertainment center. We had a TV and a little stereo. This was when you actually had stereos, kids. Um, they, they did exist. And we had this little, well, I say little, like 27-inch TV or whatever it was. It weighed like 4,000 pounds. Y'all know the ones I'm talking about. And we had it just kind of sitting on a little coffee table. Well, we need something a little fancier than that. So uh, I think we went to a furniture store and we found the, the, the nicest looking, cheapest entertainment center that we could, we could afford. And I was working at the golf course and it was raining that day. And so we got off a little early and she was still at work. And I said, well, heck, I'm going to get this thing out and I'll put it together. And so I got it out of the box, and there's 8,000 parts, you know, to something that's literally this big. And so I got the directions out, and I'm like, yeah, I don't understand that. And so I threw them away. And I just started looking at the picture on the box. And I got done, and it looked pretty much like the, you know, it looked exactly like the picture on the box, except for this glass, piece of glass that had to go on to cover where the stereo and the VCR would go and all that. Well, if I had read the directions, I would have known that that was like the third piece that you had to put on the thing. And so, because I did not follow the directions, I tore it apart and then I put it back together again. You see, Solomon is going to give us the directions here this morning to help us live our life in the direction of God. And when we do not follow these directions, bad things happen. We cause a mess of things. And so I want to look at this this morning with you. We're going to start in verse number 9. It says, besides being wise. Now remember who's writing this. Solomon's writing this. Talking in the third person. He says, besides being wise, the preacher also taught the people knowledge, weighing and studying and arranging many proverbs with great care. And the preacher sought to find words of delight. And uprightly he wrote the words of truth. And the words of the wise are like goads, and the nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings that they are given by one shepherd. My son, beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. In the end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. This is the point of the book of Ecclesiastes. And so I want to break down verses 9 through 14 this morning. And the first thing we're going to look at is the teaching. We're going to look at the teaching. He says, in addition to being a wise man, so Solomon says that he's wise. He said, the preacher also taught the people in knowledge. And he pondered and searched and, ar and arranged many proverbs. The preacher sought to find delight, delightful words and to write the words of truth correctly. So, how many of you have had the occasion in your life to teach somebody something? It doesn't mean that you're a teacher necessarily, but you have had the, the option or the, the um, opportunity to teach somebody something that they did not know. Solomon is going to give us some directions this morning about how we should teach. He's going to tell us whether we're a teacher or whether we're a preacher or whether we're, we're 
mothers and fathers and we're teaching our kids or we're grandparents and we're teaching our grandchildren, whatever it is, he's going to give us some, some instructions here about how we should teach. And he says the way that, that he taught the people, he says he taught them knowledge, first of all. He taught them knowledge. When we teach, there has to be something that we teach. There has to be some substance to it. We don't just get up here. Now, maybe some of you think I do on Sunday morning. I don't know. But we don't just get up here and start running our mouth to hear our teeth chatter. There has to be something of substance behind what we're saying. There has to be some knowledge that is imparted. But he says he taught the people knowledge. He wasn't just teaching the knowledge. He was teaching the people. You see, Solomon, what he was doing is he was teaching a subject to the people so that they could understand it. He understood his audience, first of all. He understood what they were, what they needed. He understood the subject, and so he was putting it to them in a way that was relatable. He wanted to be able for them to understand it and then apply it to their life. It says that he pondered and he searched many and arranged many proverbs. It means he was diligent. He knew his subject that he was teaching thoroughly. You know, Solomon said what? That everything, he had studied everything under the sun. That he had either done it or he had looked into it, but he was diligent in trying to find the knowledge. It doesn't do us any good to teach something we don't know anything about. That don't stop a lot of people today. But you've got to understand what you're trying to teach. I can't teach calculus. Just going to go ahead and tell you that. Wouldn't even attempt it because I've never understood it. From the time I took it to today, I don't know anything more about calculus than I did when I started. So for me to be able to teach it, I would have to do a lot of diligent study to be able to regurgitate something back. You know, I, we talk to our ball players all the time, and, and from, from youth all the way to, to um, the college level. If you want to really understand something completely, Guess what is the best way to do that? To teach it. And so several years ago, we used to have the college kids give camps to the little kids because how were they going to teach the kids something they didn't know anything about? They had to learn it first before they could. And that's what Solomon did. He said he had to learn it so that he could teach it. And then he said that he used, sought to find delightful words, or as some of your translations might say, just the right words. It's not enough when you teach necessarily just to have words, but you have to have the right words, words that people can understand, words that people can relate to. Solomon tried to make it interesting so that people would not just fall asleep while he was teaching. This was probably 25 years ago. My assistant and I went down to the uh, Golf Course Superintendents Association, uh, the Carolinas Association meeting at Myrtle Beach. And we were going to take a class on different turf grass diseases. This was a class that we really needed to freshen up on because there were some new diseases that they had, had identified that were affecting turf grass in different ways and we needed to make sure that we, we were up on it so that we could be on the lookout when we were managing the golf course. And so this class was supposed to be from 8 in the morning till 4 in the afternoon with an hour break for lunch. And this doctor, this PhD from Clemson University was going to give the, the lecture that day. And he was a very, very, very smart guy. I had met him uh, a time or two before. We had done some, some trials out on the golf course about some stuff. Brilliant man. We go in at 8 o'clock, and he opens up his lecture book, and he puts the pictures on the screen, and he says, Let me begin with brown patch. Brown patch. Rhizoctonia, whatever, whatever. And this went on for two hours. 
Finally, we had our first break, and I looked at my assistant, and I said, I ain't doing this. Not for six more hours. It ain't happening. He said, you ain't going to get credit. I said, I'll just have to take this class again later because I'm going home. And so back to the hotel we went because there was no way I could sit through that for eight hours. Wasn't going to happen, right? And so the man was smart, brilliant, knew his subject matter thoroughly, but he could not find the right words to use to keep people interested. It would literally have put you to sleep to sit there for six or eight hours. Solomon said he wanted to be effective in his communication so that he could capture the attention of his readers, to his listeners. And so he was knowledgeable. He was diligent. He used the right words. But here's the most important thing about teaching anything. It says the preacher sought to write the words of truth correctly. Solomon wanted to communicate the truth to people. He wasn't just teaching something. He was teaching the truth. And unfortunately in our culture today, Truth is not something that is celebrated. The truth is not something that is celebrated. And the reason it's not is because people have bought into that the truth is relative. The fact of the matter is people have really bought into the idea that I can have my truth and Miss Arlene can have her truth, and Carla can have her truth, and Gary can have his truth, and Jim can have, and we can all have a different version of the truth. And it's true to us, no matter if it's true to anybody else. Well, what is the problem with that? You can't have two things that say they're equal at the same time. It can't, it can't happen. You can't have this one that says it's the truth and this one that says it's the truth and they are offering different opinions at the same time. It can't happen. One of those or both of them have to be wrong, but they both cannot be right in the same context. It can't happen that way. But people say, oh, yeah, yeah, you can have your truth and I can have my truth and we can just go on living in the truth. Well, guess what? A lie all dressed up in eloquence is still a lie. The problem with the truth and why people don't like the truth is because sometimes the truth hits you right in the face. It stares you right in the face and it convicts you of what you're doing. The truth sometimes hurts, especially when you're not living according to the truth. You know, when Jesus came to earth and he started his earthly ministry, did he tell the truth? All the time. Never told anything that wasn't the truth. Did people love him for telling them the truth? No. He told the truth about the Pharisees, right? He told the truth about the religious leaders, the Sadducees. He told the truth about our condition before the Father. And he told the world that they were sinful and unless they got right with God through him, what was going to happen? They were going to die in their sins. The truth hit them right in the face, the reality of what he said. Solomon has done the same thing in this book. He has told us the truth. We might look at the book and read some of the things he said and thought, you know what? He's out of line here, but he ain't wrong. We might have thought that. But there's nothing in there that we could look at and say, you know what? He's wrong about that. When you study it, everything that he said was correct. It was the truth. And it shouldn't surprise us because the Bible is full of truth. The Bible is all truth from the beginning to the end. There's no lie. The Word of God is infallible. It's inerrant. And so everything in there is the truth. That's what Solomon said. I am going to write down the truth that you can have it through the Word of God. That is our truth. 
That is the truth. The truth is, is Jesus Christ is Lord of all. That is the gospel truth. 100%. But Solomon says the second thing is, is the teaching, the truth, the word of God does two things for us. It does two things for us. He says the words of the wise men are like goads. And masters of the collections are like well-driven nails and they are given by one shepherd. There's a parallel here. We call it, uh, in Hebrew, they call it chiastic form. It's two thoughts that are put together in opposite lines. It's kind of, kind of a poetic type way to write something. But he says here that there are goads and there are well-driven nails. He said the words of the wise men are like goads. Well, what is a goad? A goad simply is a sharp stick with a point on it. It's a stick with a point. What they would do is when they were driving their animals, if the animal didn't want to go the way they wanted, they'd take the sharp stick and stick him with it. And it would make him go the way that they wanted him to go. Now, well-driven nails, what do they do? If you take some nails and you put some boards together and you nail them, it keeps the boards from falling apart, right? That is what it does. So you have two different thoughts here. This, this is really talking about what the Word of God does in our life. When we study the truth of the Word of God, we see that it does a couple of different things. The goads were temporary. Once they got the livestock to where they wanted it to go, they didn't need goads anymore, right? They didn't have to keep poking them. Instead, what would they do? They would put them in maybe in a corral where they had fences built that would keep them in place. Look at it like this. The goads were temporary. The nails are permanent. The goads were used to create movement. The nails were used to hold something in place. Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. You say, well, how does this all work out? And, and that's nice to know about goads and nails, but how does this work out in our life? Well, the Word of God does two things for us. The first one is when we get comfortable. And we do get comfortable. We like comfort. We like it the way we like it. We don't like change. And so we, we get comfortable, but then sometimes we run across a piece of Scripture and we read it, or maybe we hear it preached from the pulpit, or we hear it on the radio, but we hear the Word of God, and it speaks to us, and it begins to move us out of our comfort zones. It moves us to a different place, and it pushes us to do things that we ought to be doing. But maybe we're not doing because it's uncomfortable. You see, in the Christian life, sometimes we have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. God does not use His Word to just make us settle in and sit in a pew. He uses the Word like a goat to get us out of the pews and into the communities and into the world to be able to spread the gospel message. I had a pastor this week at the, the Southern Baptist uh, Convention of Colorado, and he was talking about comfortable comfortableness in the church and he says to him uh, the church had lost a lot of its passion because it had gotten too comfortable he said and he said he was he was originally from Cuba he was originally from Cuba and he said the symptom happened in the Cuban church before the communist revolution in Cuba and he said so what happened was that the church lost its passion and so God brought persecution to move the church out of its comfort zone. He said here's the problem with the church in America is it has grown comfortable today and so we need to regain the passion before God sends the persecution. He said, but either way, God's going to use his word to move his people to do his work. He said, it's our choice, either regain the passion or suffer the persecution. 
God uses the word to drive us out of our comfort zone. But then also, like the nails, he uses it to anchor us in place. You might have had times of struggle, times of turmoil, times to where you feel like you're just, you're in a boxing match with Mike Tyson and that you're just taking uppercut after uppercut after uppercut and if that ain't enough, there's somebody in the back behind you throwing haymakers and you just keep catching them right in the forehead. doesn't matter what you can do. You can't escape it. You feel like that's the way maybe your life has been going. That you're just in this constant storm and being tossed to and fro. Well, see, the Word of God also acts as a haven of stability. Because we read the words of Jesus even in Matthew 11 and 28. And He says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We read those words and we can take comfort in the fact that our Heavenly Father has never abandoned us. And that we might be going and, and we might be catching haymakers from life, but He is right there with us fighting on our behalf. And we know from the Word of God that the victory will be His. That He's going to fight and it doesn't matter what comes upon us, that eventually God will win in the end and we can take comfort in knowing that. You know, one of my favorite pieces of Scripture in all of the Bible is, is the book of Jude. And at the very end of the book of Jude, there's a doxology. And it goes something like this in verse 24. It says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of His glory with great joy. To the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory and majesty, dominion and authority before all time now and forevermore. Did you catch the first part of that? He says to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling. You might be catching the haymakers this morning, but God's going to keep you on your feet. He's not going to count you out. He's going to pick you up and he's going to nail you in place on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. That is the great news of the gospel is that Jesus Christ is our rock and on his foundation we stand, not our own. The last thing that I want to talk about here this morning Solomon talked about, well, it's actually two things. I'm going to talk about this really quickly, the tiredness. Solomon said, beyond this, my son, be warned. The writing of many books is endless. And excessive devotion to books is wearing to the body. Students, don't think this is an excuse not to study. Do your homework. Study your lessons. What Solomon is saying here is it's not a knowledge problem, it's an application problem. He said you can read all these books and you can, and, and you know, we live in the age of information today. We can have all the information we want right at the tip of our fingers just like that. But you know what the problem is? It's kind of overwhelming, isn't it? Kind of overwhelming. You want to read something, you pull it up, and I'm not joking when, when I tell you when I go to study you know, uh, for a sermon or something, there's a couple of different websites, a couple of different commentaries that, that I will look at, you know, as I'm, as I'm looking at, at different, you know, Hebrew words or Greek words, doing word studies, all this kind of stuff. But if I want an opinion on a certain verse, there's this one website specifically that I, and it has probably for John 3.16, there will be 1,400 different people that has written something on there. And they've all got a different way that they look at it and they take from it and all that. And so to read all of those things and come up with something that is hard because it's all a bunch of different opinions. That's where I want to caution you here this morning. We like to read books sometimes about the Word of God when we really should want to read the Word of God more. We need to be in the Word of God because the Word of God is the only Word of truth. 
Remember that they, these other people that have written about it, they're fallible men, right? They don't always have it right. Now, God has given a lot of those people to us to help us along, especially in some of these passages that are really, really complicated, right? He's given us a lot of smart men, but these men aren't the gospel. They aren't the Bible. They are writing about it. And so you can, if you want to find an opinion on the Bible, I guarantee you, you can find one. However you want to look about it, somebody has written something on it. That doesn't make it right. It just means that's their opinion. We need to make sure that we're in the Word of God and compare what those people have said to what the Word of God actually says. Not only is it knowledge, but also application. The whole goal of any book is to have people take what they read in it and be able to apply it somehow in their life. Well, I can tell you of the hundreds and hundreds of books that I have ended up reading throughout the years on, the, you know, on different parts of the Bible and things like that, there is no possible way I could apply everything that they have said in these books to my life. It is impossible. Because someone inevitably will say, hey, you need to do this, and then the other book over here says, no, don't do that. He said, if you spend all your time Studying those kind of things, you're going to end up miserable and you're not going to get very far. He said, stick to the word of truth because it will never let you down. And then finally here, he said, here's the truth. He said, this is the truth. He said, in conclusion, when all has been heard, this is the end. Fear God and keep his commandments. He said, this applies to every person. He said, and this is the book, what Solomon said, this is the book about wisdom, right? This is the book about wisdom. He says, this is the grand sum of all wisdom, to fear God and keep his commandments. This is, something, this is not something new that Solomon is just bringing about. This has been written many times in the scripture. Job chapter 28 says, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Psalm in 111, it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all of those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. Proverbs chapter 1 verse 7, it says, The fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. This is not something Solomon just came up with. This is something repeated throughout Scripture. And so when we see it repeated time and time and time again, it's probably something that we ought to take a look at a little more seriously. So what does it mean here? What does it mean to fear God? It means that we should have a reverence for God as the holy, sovereign, incalculable, creator of this universe someone who is so much higher than we are we cannot have an understanding completely of who he is it's beyond our possibilities to know God as completely as he is it is to be like the Israelites in Exodus chapter 20 where Moses went up on the mountain and God was giving him the Ten Commandments, but he came down and the Israelites said to Moses in verses 19 and 20, they said it like this, they said, Speak to us yourself and we will listen. And let not God speak to us lest we die. They were scared to death. Of God because they had a comprehension of who he was. They were on the mountain. They were down below. They looked up on the mountain. They saw the smoke. They saw the thunder. They saw the lightning. They saw the presence of God descend on that mountain and it shook them to their core. They were afraid. This is the kind of fearfulness that we need to understand about God. God is not safe. As we think about safety, God is a God of holiness. God is a God of, of 
justice. God is a God of love as well, but all those things are balanced together to make him who he is. Too many people have looked at God and they think that he's their buddy. God is not your buddy. He's your heavenly father. Jesus is your friend that sticks closer than a brother, but God is altogether higher than anything that we can imagine. And so we have to have the proper thoughts about God. And it says that when we have that proper fear of God, it brings us into a better relationship with him. It draws us closer to him. As a matter of fact, that's what Solomon said here. He says, fear God and keep his commandments. Because when you have the right idea about who God is, then you want to keep his commandments because you don't want to break them for fear of what will happen. You can raise your hand, not raise your hand. How many of you, when you were younger, I think maybe even still today, had a fear of your father? Absolutely. 100%. Not that my dad was a bad dad at all. Matter of fact, he was a great dad. But I knew (laughs) that there were certain things that if I did, that I would have to pay a consequence for. And usually some of the hardest lessons I ever learned were applied to my backside. But there was a fear there of not crossing my dad's rules. And so if I didn't want to get in trouble, I better do what he told me to, right? It's the same kind of idea that Solomon's bringing out here. If we fear God, we will not want to break his commandments. We won't want to because we know that God is a God of judgment. It just says it here. Everything will be brought into judgment. Nothing hidden from God. We'll have to give an account. Solomon says that's his motivation in verse 14. He said, that's the motivation that I bring to this thing is that I fear God and I want to keep his commandments because I do not want to face his judgment. That's the idea that Solomon's bringing out here. As a matter of fact, in verse 20 of Exodus 20, he said, Moses said to the people, do not be afraid for God has come in order to test you and in order that the fear of him may remain in you so that you may not sin. The fear of God will restrain sin in our life. It doesn't mean we're going to live a life that's perfect. But it does restrain sin in our life because when we have the right idea about who God is, we do not want to offend Him. We do not want to go against Him. And Solomon says this applies to everybody. This isn't just for, for me And a few other selected ones, no. He says this is the end of all men. This means for everybody. Here's the good news in all of this. Here's the good news. God is the judge. And ultimately we will have to give an account. Good, bad, whatever it is. But for those of you who have believed in Jesus Christ, you'll have to give an account, but you won't have to pay the penalty for the sin. And so when you look at God and we look at him as as this holy other entity so much higher than us, we also have to look at his other side, which is grace and mercy, because he's offered that to us in place of his judgment. He has offered us grace in that we don't get the penalty for what we deserve. That he has placed the penalty for sin on Jesus Christ on the cross. And so when we look at it and we see our sinfulness in front of a holy God, it ought to make us run to the cross to where we can have the blood applied and our sins forgiven. And then, as we sing this morning, we can sing to God how great thou art because you have taken the penalty of sin, you've applied it to your son on the cross, and I am free. That is the greatest news that any of us could ever, ever, ever have. But we have to go to the cross of Jesus Christ first. 
and say, Lord, I understand that I am a sinner that I am a sinner, that I have fallen short of your glory and that I deserve the judgment, but thank you that you have given Christ in my place. And I plead the blood of Jesus and I ask for forgiveness and I know in your great mercy that is exactly what you give. You know, our uh, FCA this year, we, we have a theme verse every year that we, we use throughout the school year for the students. And this year, our verse is out of Romans chapter 10. It says, for all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's our verse. We got t-shirts and everything. But it's not just a verse that we put on the back of a t-shirt. This is a verse that we have to live out in our life. It's a verse that says to those who call on the name of the Lord, those who have asked Jesus Christ for forgiveness, they have called on His great mercy and His love for us. Those are the ones who will be saved. Not just will be saved, but are saved. Those who call on the name of the Lord or have called on the name of the Lord, guess what? You're saved. Those of you who hadn't called on the name of the Lord, you're not saved. And Solomon says, those who are not saved, there's a judgment that awaits. I want to make sure that you understand that this morning, the difference between facing God in judgment, knowing the penalty has been paid already. Or facing God knowing that you're going to have to face the penalty of your sin. There's a world of difference in those two views. And so this morning we're going to have a, a time of, of invitation. We're going to sing hymn number 572. If I can get it over there because I don't always remember the words to all the hymns. So we're going to sing hymn number 572. I love to tell the story. We're going to sing hymn uh, verses number 1 and 3. But I'm going to leave you with this verse right here out of Psalm chapter 32. It says, How blessed is he who transgressions are forgiven, whose sin is covered, and how blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and to whose spirit there is no deceit. You know how you get to apply that verse? By calling on the name of the Lord in salvation. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, that you have offered us salvation in your Son. Lord, that you sent him on the cross to die for our sins. Lord, to take the penalty of sin away. Lord, that we can have life everlasting in him if we will just call on his name and repent. Lord, ask him into our life to save us for eternity. Lord, thank you for that. Lord, if there's someone here who does not know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray this morning that they will get it right before they leave this place. Lord, that they would turn their life to you and make the wisest decision that they've ever made. Lord, help us to have that fear and reverence. Lord, where we don't want to cross you, Lord, we want to keep your word and do exactly what you have told us to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And so won't you stand with me? The altar's open. We're going to sing verse number one and verse number three. Jesus.
us and his love. I love to tell the story for those who know it best. Seem hungering and thirsting to hear it like the rest. And when in scenes of glory I sing the new, new song, twill be the old, old story that I have loved so long. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love.